Hello everybody and welcome to the EGXW Info Group of Twitter Accounts YouTube channel. And today we are going to talk about how to go spotting like a boss. So this is how I would recommend you prepare and uh, go out and enjoy your day and get the most from it. Uh, first of all I'm going to apologise for the sound, I've had some terrible trouble and I've uh, already recorded this video once and my microphone died halfway through so it didn't pick up any sound so I'm having to do it again so I'm using a headset mic um, with the mic very close to my mouth so hopefully I'm not gonna sound like a strange uh, caller who's calling you on the evening and start heavy breathing at you I've positioned it as best as I can so please bear with me as usual this is going to be done in one take because um, due to my health I can't sit at the PC very long um, so my editing time is zero I have to sit here and go for it um, so that's what I'm going to be doing today and I'll be waffling on talking rubbish it's probably going to be about an hour long this one um, that's about as fast as I can do it but I'll try and rattle through as fast as I can while giving you time to focus on things that you need to so for this video I'm going to make a couple of assumptions and the assumption number one that you are a photographer and you're going to be taking pictures and assumption number two is you are a scanner user you've got a scanner and you know what to do with it so to speak um, if you are not a photographer or a scanner user or one or the other then just bear with me um, fast forward through the bits uh, that you don't need um, but the rest of it is going to be relevant to you Okay, so there's various things that you are going to want to know uh, you, about an airfield that you're planning to visit. So you've earmarked a date and you've earmarked a location. Uh, uh, you're going to want to know things like how many runways are there? What are their runway numbers? What are the local circuit um, directions? What's the weather going to be like? Where's the sun going to be from for your photographers? Uh, what are the scanner frequencies? Uh, where can I go? Uh, is there a viewing area, etc.? So now I'm going to tell you exactly where to find all that information and also where I think is best to record all that information to make your day go as smoothly as possible. So first things first, without further ado, we will dry, dive in and where to record this information. Personally, I would get yourself on Google My Maps because this will give you a map of the area and it will let you draw pretty things on your map. And we're going to be finding lots of pretty things to draw on our map today, as you will see as the video goes on. So get yourself onto Google My Maps. Now the first thing I would do would be change the base map to satellite imagery because satellite imagery is going to give you loads of intelligence about where you are going to go. So first thing I would do is zoom in and I'm just going to do this very roughly for now for example purposes. I'm going to have a look and see where the secure areas of the base are um, and where they're not. And I'm just going to draw around these secure areas here. Um, and you'll see as I draw around the map, um, this might not be accurate, like I say, just for example purposes only, because this is going to be important to you because it will show you where you're allowed to go and where you're not allowed to go. And with anything, remember the six P's. Piss poor planning leads to piss poor performance. So we are going to do our planning. Probably going to want to do this the day before. Or, or start it a few days before and come back to it. Something like that. Um, I haven't got a clue where the uh, fence line is now as I'm waffling on, but remember, piss poor planning, piss poor performance, so do your planning. This is probably something I should remember when I'm doing my YouTube videos, um, so hopefully we don't s drop into the poor performance category too much. Um, let's pretend we're going along here. Mm. Uh, yeah. 
So I've been to Connorsby a couple of times before. So I kind of know where the boundary fences are. Um, but I haven't got a clue when it comes to this area. So I'm just going to make some educated guesses. And then finally, get back to the start. And here we have a nice polygon. And I would label that something like secure. And I would go in here and I would make it red, not orange, because that looks awful. And here we have our secure area. So when you're doing your planning, you know where you can and can't go roughly speaking because if you go inside that fence or try and jump over the fence you'll get shot and uh, it's not going to be a very good YouTube video if I go and get you shot now is it active military base remember folks so let's try not get you shot okay so that is our secure area mapped out the second thing I would look for is busy roads now not particularly a problem at Coningsby although Langwood Road can get a little bit busy but if you have any um, busy roads it could be an idea to map that because they're going to be more difficult to park along so let's for argument's sake Langwood Road and we'll call that our busy road for all the purposes of our example so here you're not going to expect to park on the roadside and any places you're thinking about parking you're going to have to do your homework on or take a steady drive out there um, sometimes you know have a look at the verges have a look at field entrances I mean you can, field entrances are good places to park but um, you've got to make sure that they can get in and out of the field entrances in big old tractors and trailers plenty of turning room that you're not going to be blocking um, uh, any field entrances specifically and being of the local farmers because that's not a good idea um, and I would only park in a field entrance area if I was going to remain with the car. Um, so that if you did inadvertently do something a bit stupid um, and block a field entrance, the farmer can yell some expletives at you and get you to move your vehicle. Um, another no-no is parking at crash gates. So sometimes it can be handy to mark the crash gates, but obviously don't park in front of crash gates they are there for the big old fire engines to punch through at a fair old rate of knots should the worst happen and an aircraft come down so kind of rule one in the spotter's handbook is do not obstruct crash gates okay so we've got our security area marked our busiest roads and um, one thing i would do now is i would quickly map the fastest route from one runway threshold to another so that if you need to get from one end of the airfield to the other quick smart you know exactly which route you are going to take to get there so that's that uh, we will rename that quick change you can name it whatever you want you don't have to name it that obviously you may have better grasps of the English language than I have and better ideas for labels but that's my say my quickest route from one end of the runway to another okay so we've talked about where to record this information and as we go through the video I'll be adding things to this map you'll see what I mean so where to get this information now first of all um, you want to be checking the AIP the aeronautical information publication for military airfields you want the military AIP and for civil airfields you want the civil AIP and in part three of the uh, respective AIPs you will find the aerodrome information part three aerodromes so for today's example we're going to visit RAF Collingsby now for RF Coningsby, we have this handy PDF with lots of information about where RF Coningsby is. If you need a postcode for your sat nav, that'll probably get you to the front gate. Some phone numbers are there. I wouldn't advise you ringing them. 
this information is for pilots, not for spotters, and you're going to be quickly told where to go. There's going to be loads of information on here that is not going to be for you, but there's going to be some very specific information that will be very helpful, such as runway numbers. You can also go back onto your satellite imagery, zoom in to the runway and find the runway numbers. Now runway numbers are important because they mean something, they're not just two random numbers that people have um, dealt into their deepest imagination and come up with at random. So the runway numbers are basically the runway headings in two degree format, so chopping off the last unit. So for runway 25 the runway heading is approximately 250 degrees so up to five degrees either side magnetic variation and all that annual change so runway 25 would be heading approximately 250 degrees this way and of course the reciprocal of that will be a heading of 070 degrees and we chop the last digit off and we call it runway 07 that's how runway numbers work very handy so with any runway number you know whereabouts in the compass ring it is pointing to. So from the AIP you have found your runway numbers and sometimes you'll have uh, obviously long main runways and suspiciously short secondary runways. So here we go and then keep scrolling along and you will find your scanner frequencies. Um, so assuming you know how to use your scanner you can program them in now I always say that scanner frequencies are like an onion layer so you can choose what you listen to the closest stuff for example ground will be all focused on this area and this area and these areas that'll be ground so that'll be the most relevant information for you about things maneuvering on the airfield further out you have tower and that will be sort of and this area, anything that's in visual contact with the airfield. Further out you have approach frequencies, which will be these areas. And then further out you'll have radar, which will be these areas. So that will be less relevant, you will get more irrelevant traffic. So it's very much about programming them into your scanner and strategically choosing what is on the scanner at any given time to what you want to hear about. Um, and which layers of the onion you want. You could be very silly and listen to a big old wide area and get loads of irrelevant information that is not going to aid your spotting. So get used to having the right frequencies in the scanner. So also on here, let's have a look, I think the charts have been combined. You have things like taxi charts and Everdrome uh, diagrams very useful so here it's got your dispersals on so when they're talking about taxing from echo taxing from sierra taxing from foxtrot you know exactly where these are you can stick them on your map as well if you want again echo sierra foxtrot the main asp those will be your common locations all your holding points are on there so if taxi to alpha 2 taxi to delta 2 you know exactly where the planes are going to be um, another useful thing, which is, I believe, just above here, uh, noise abatement circuits. So um, this is going to be very uh, interesting. Well, very interesting. Probably not. Depends on your scale of geekery, I guess. Uh, but very useful to you because it's going to show you the uh, visual circuits in the area. And you can see here that the typical fast jet circuit is this area here to the south of the airfield. Um, and the BBMF are authorised to do a northerly circuit. They can, of course, do southerly circuits. That's the normal circuit fitting in with the rest of the traffic pattern. Um, but it's going to be very handy to know. So if we're on 27, it's going to be left-hand circuits. And if we're um, oh, sorry, 25, it's going to be left-hand circuits. And if we're going to be on 07, it's going to be right-hand circuits. So keeping all the traffic to the south. This is going to be the live side of the runway runways here and this is going to be the dead side of the runway and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along 
So you've got your scanner frequencies in, you've got the noise abatement procedure, um, SIDs, um, there might be some SIDs around, I think I saw some SIDs. SIDs are standard instrument departures, or oh, we have MIDs, which are military instrument departures, same as SIDs in SFL airfield. Uh, they can be quite interesting, interesting, useful to you because um, a lot of the times uh, in military airfields the aircraft will get up to these minimum heights very quickly and you'll find that they will turn very quickly and that little turn can give you a brilliant opportunity for photography it might just tilt the jet in exactly the right place for you to uh, get a very quick but very nice photograph so uh, SIDS and MIDS can be handy for you to know and then these are probably less handy for you to know Okay, so we have mids and sids and all the rest of it. Are there any custom pilot instructions? So I know for a fact there are custom pilot instructions available online for RF Coningsby. Places to check uh, Google. Google is your friend. Um, remember that these documents are for pilots uh, primarily. They're not for spotters, but they can give you uh, handy bits for your spotting pleasure um so you you can search things like uh, visual traffic procedures your respective airfields or pilot instructions check the RAF website check the US Air Force websites for places like Lake and Heath Milton Hall Fairford etc etc um so check for custom pilot instructions and then because all this information is official and that's going to be your best source of information and uh, when we start talking more about the spotters websites you're going to find that some of that information isn't accurate some of them it might be out of date these websites the official ones are updated regularly so they're the best port of call in the first instance uh, fighter control this is uh, probably one of the most popular spotting websites and in fighter control you will see spotting areas for different airfields so if we dive into RAF Coningsby's um, sub forum uh, we will see uh, things like frequency lists so you'll find that uh, somebody's done you a nice frequency list uh, because what you won't have on your official uh, paperwork is things like air to air frequencies and squadron ops frequencies you'll only have towers and things like that and you will probably find if you scroll to the end somebody's updated uh, people have posted updates as these things go on because obviously this was originally posted in 16 but they've got updated in September 19 crucially there were UHF changes that I've talked about in previous videos in December 19 so you're going to want to make sure that whatever it is has been updated after September uh, December 19 for military airfields obviously we have our own website that you can check and uh, the UK frequency guidebook uh, by Rick King's very good for 15 pounds you can buy this book and it has user submitted and official frequencies merged into there very handy resource and uh, we've also got these airfield guides from PB photos and um, now you can order one of these gu uh, guides in print as we can see here for 24 quid and uh, there's an electronic version for 16 pound 49 that you might want to take a look at here and i believe there's also got some free ones probably in here somewhere uh, yeah look at that so and this is going to be more geared towards spotters of course it's a download above or below it's down below there you go rf coningsby so uh yep here we go look it's got, got some, nice, some nice information about the squadrons, the aircraft, frequencies, and common photography location. And so you can go back to the map and you can put these waypoints on your map here. Um, one website I haven't preloaded is Thunder and Lightnings. They have an airfield viewing guide section here. 
Um, which is going to be very useful. Uh, so I've got R. Cummingsby. And these can be a little bit more out of date, I've noticed. Um, but it's an excellent guide. He's labelled l- loads of different waypoints around the airfield alphabetically. And then below, he talks about what you can expect to see at these different locations and some examples of pictures taken from certain points and what camera you need etc etc so a really valuable resource and a lot of work's gone into that um, and it is very useful indeed and let's have a look at my notes to keep me on track facebook groups and uh, that's another good one you'll find that most uh, busy airfields have active spotter facebook groups um, that you can join and get information on and one thing i would say is check the announcements in there they often have flying information in the announcements and also check the file section if you're interested in things like scanner frequencies so don't just go in there and ask uh when when something flying can you tell me when something's flying because if you go in there and ask when's when things going to be flying um well you deserve to be shot really don't you no any joking unless you're a pretty girl you're not going to get away with it so if you're a pretty girl ask away um you know spotters are used to hanging around at airfields and uh, stereotypically male um so they'll be straight in there helping you out if you're a pretty girl but if like me you're not a pretty girl probably don't ask um when's the flying gonna be because you're not gonna get very far now uh weather and things like that um let's have a look so on our website under everything else mobile apps i've got some weather apps which are these are very useful uh i've got ios and android apps here um, because aircraft land into the wind so we go back to our map here if the wind is coming from the west they're going to move on to land into the wind to the east and vice versa uh, so wind direction is going to be extremely important for you um, as I lose where I'm in my tabs so the winds here um, in the weather you have uh so this is weather geared for pilots basically so you've got metars which are the meteorological actual reports from uh, the airfield they're generally updated every hour uh, and it's an automated system and it will tell you things like where your winds coming from your cloud base you also have tafts uh, terminal forecasts and that will give you a, a overview of the next sort of couple of days generally speaking and these forecasts will be made by the meteorological units on site um so generally more up to date than some ai driven generic or web apps that cover the rest of the world you'll generally find this is a little bit more accurate with local trends and it's also got a handy notams uh, section here um it's been updated with like runway diagram uh, to show your crosswind components things like that station weather plus another one another good one um this is my favored non-aviation themed weather app and then some flight planning software so some useful stuff there so from that you will probably find you know which direction um aircraft are going to be landing and taking off into so like i say if the wind's coming from the west they're going to be wanting to take off into wind they're going to be wanting to land into wind they always want it to go into wind so wind is especially important okay now we can probably uh dive into uh, reserve locations so it's worth having a reserve location when you're visiting an airfield because if something goes wrong so there's an emergency on the runway and the runway ends up being blocked or as we call the runway is black we is what we call it um runway is black means that the the runway is not operational due to reasons other than weather all the other color code codes are weather related um and black is a reason other than weather 
Um, so if your runway, if you rock up at your airfield in the morning and five minutes into flying, the runway goes black and it's expected to be closed for the day, you're going to want a reserve airfield. So perhaps pick another airfield in the area as a reserve location to map out. Um, visitor centers. A lot of these places have visitor centers. So, for example, Arif Coningsby has the BBMF uh, visitor center that you can go into uh, at any time, access to the public. A lot of these places have heritage centers. I know Waddington, Coningsby, Scampton all have heritage centers, but they are inside the wire so to speak inside that secure area we've drawn out so that you need to pre-book quite a while in advance and produce things like uh, photo identification um, which you need to bring on the day so if you're going to be planning a visit in the future and you want to take part in a heritage center tour you need to do a bit more planning um, but give them a shout out so some very enjoyable trips to be had um, Okay, so we will dive back into our Google My Maps. So we've got our secure area, we've got our busy roads. If you're a photographer, sun direction. Um, so I've put, uh, for example purposes, uh, Lake and Heath because I filmed the first video about Lake and Heath where I decided to change to Coningsby for my second example. So if you have a quick Google for uh, sun calculators, sun direction calculators, uh, there's loads of apps on iOS and Android as well that will do the same thing. It will tell you where your sun's going to be uh, throughout the day. Um, and you can drag this slider up. Here we go. Whee! Going back in time. So I'm back to the future. I'm expecting Marty McFly to pop out at 88 miles an hour in a minute. Um, so... You can see at any time of the day when you when when you're expected to be there. So you're going to start at 12 and you're going to go at three. You can see that the sun's going to move around in this direction. So on your handy map, you can draw uh, where your sun is going to be coming from if you wanted to. So say example, say it's going to be in this area. You could draw a line, call it sun. You know. I'm ever so such an imaginative person. Um, I'll colour it orange like the sun. Look, Ooh, we could see our dark sun direction. Let me move that a bit over here for example purposes. So yeah, sun direction. That's where we can expect thing the sun to be, because obviously as a photographer, you're going to want the sun behind you when you're photographing aircraft as much as possible, unless you're doing something terribly artistic and beyond my capabilities you're going to want the sun behind you and you're going to be wanting that sun to be coming down bouncing off the aircraft and then bouncing straight down your camera lens to get the best photographs um, so sun direction is going to be ever so important to you so now you've been through all these websites you've got all the information you found out that due to the wind tomorrow runway 25 is going to be in use so you can start plotting uh, what's going to happen to all the aircraft that are in the air. So, and we know that because of circuits, circuit patterns, the pattern that all aircraft fly. So, runway 25, they're going to be coming in at this angle, aren't they? They're, they're, they're then going to be turning. And remember, left hand circuits to keep them on the south side. So, this is the live side, they're going to be turning. Here, going out here, going out here, and this is a what they call a circuit, a visual circuit. They are in visual contact with the airfield. This is a visual, visual circuit, and all four sides of the circuit have a name, which I will explain to you in a second when I've straightened it up a bit. So, this is on finals. So an aircraft coming in finals to land. Uh, then the left hand turn onto crosswind leg. Left hand turn onto downwind leg. Left hand turn onto base leg. And then left hand turn onto finals. And that is how they will fly. If you remember, we had a look at our noise abatement, uh, visual circuit. And again, 
there is the visual circuit there. Now, for experts, you will notice this looks like a bit like a civil circuit because military aircraft fly the ends generally in one. So they are oval ends, and you can make an oval end yourself by doing exactly what I'm doing here. Now, generally speaking, things like fast jets, they will space themselves in the circuit. This might be a little bit wide, this circuit, to be honest. But you'll get the idea. They will space themselves in the circuit by putting the uh, wing tip or a visual reference similar to that um, on the runway as they're flying downwind. Okay, look at that. It's a good job pilots don't have to fly from my diagrams, isn't it? I'll be having a right wiggle. Um, so it might be a bit long and a bit higgledy piggledy, but for example purposes, it will do for today. Oh, that's shocking. My OCD is starting to kick off now. This is because I'm talking and drawing. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Overlens. It's now a military circuit. So this is your visual circuit, and you can colour it whatever colour you like. Um, oh, that's a bit garish, isn't it? Well, so is that. So what, let's go play them boy. The reason I'm doing that is to... Um, yeah, I'm going to need it more defined than that. We're going to have to go yellow. Right, so that's the visual circuit. And you'll find that aircraft, the, the the general you can down you can join a visual circuit on any of these legs, subject to uh, tower not um, telling you no. However, the most common way a um, fast jet will join a visual circuit is by initials. So initials, and you might have to get your ruler out for this. Is I believe half a mile. Oh, I've not flicked my ruler. I've gone back to me line drawing tool. It's a half a mile, so what that will be 800 meters. That's that looks quite big. You will you will find that it's much closer than that actually. Um, generally, it will just be along here. So, talking about initials, so I'm going to draw it backwards. I'm doing a terrible job at this. I need I need someone with better drawing skills than me. Right, so they will be joining by initials. So they'll be joining from here, and they will be flying along the dead side. Okay, so not in that, not on the live side. They'll be flying along the dead side of the runway, and then they will be pulling up to join the visual circuit crosswind here. Okay, now they will be calling initials at uh, three nautical miles away so let's let's pretend and um, the initials is uh, th three nautical miles is here so this will give you an idea of where your initials running is uh, initials and if you want you can do another tab and you put what you can have waypoints here uh, well actually no we'll stick it in circuits we'll stick it in circuits you could have your initial point marked on the map um, here. So that will give you an idea when they're running. Now that's important because you can get some really nice pictures of aircraft joining by initials because they are hoofing it in at a heck of a speed and generally with their gear up um, and giving it some uh, giving it some speed should we say to join by initials and we'll let's join that up here look oh that's terrible i've lost my midpoint now let's not join it up then but you get the idea it joins joins onto the circuit um aha found him Any uh, Google My Maps experts out there, you know? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so they'll be hoofing it down this line with the gear up 
Uh, so you'll, you get some nice pictures. So if you want the sun behind you, like I said before, hoofing it along initials, some good places to be might be out here. Uh, might be a good little waypoint for you uh, to explore. So you want to keep some probably about you know, 500, uh, well, probably, yeah, you know, they're going to be at like 500 feet or something. Could be even 300 feet. So you you probably want to give the, a bit of lateral separation to get yourself the right angle. Some behind you. Camera's pointing this way at the aircraft on initials. And you're going to get some brilliant photographs there. Um, and you can even sequence some numbers your waypoints there. So you can see here, as you've got aircraft coming into a visual circuit, you've got various points that you could be taking a picture. So if you wanted, say, the bo uh, a little bottom side shot, you want to be out here somewhere. If you want the nice shots of the gear going down, flaps going down, all the rest of it, you probably want to be out here somewhere. So it's graphing them again, some behind you, jet in front of you, perfect. If you want some lovely turning shots, you're going to be want to be out here somewhere. Uh, so you probably get the aircraft bank uh, at an angle of bank at about 45 degrees, turning on to finals. The gear will be down, uh, flaps will be set, um, but it's going to be lit up really nicely and tilted towards your camera. Um, so you can, like I say, you can start to see things. The other way uh, aircraft can join is uh, by the radar pattern. Um, and they'll be coming straight in. And the reason I mentioned that the uh, radar pattern is particularly civil airports, you will find that they will always join uh, the radar pattern and come straight in. Very rarely will you see your big stuff um, doing visual uh, visual joins um, or anything like that. So it might be an idea to, oh, what have I done here? Broken it already. Um, so it might be an idea to have the radar pattern um, mapped out. So the radar pattern is generally speaking 10 mile finals. So in line with the runway, 10 miles and what's miles into kilometers? 1.6, so it'd be about 16 kilometers. Oh, we're getting right the way over here now. I'm straining myself. So 16 kilometers. So they'll be feeding them in. Let's get that a little bit straighter. Feed them in approximately there. Uh, so I'm going to stick uh, him uh, there. Uh, pattern. Um, I'll do that, and then we can draw a line all the way down to the touchdown zone. Here we go. Well, orange is sun. Yellow is traffic. Okay, so they'll be feeding them in by here. So they're going to be quite high. They're going to be two, two and a half, maybe even three thousand feet, depending on your um, glide path. So it's not going to be the best for photography, but it's going to be useful to know what direction they're coming in um, and generally they will be fed in at a 45 degree angle to that point so you could even put the, the 45 degrees in here to give you an idea of where radar traffic will be fed in because you might want uh, something different for your shots so here we have the radar traffic here we have the initials and here we have the visual circuit live side and the dead side mapped up. So what else can we map up? Uh, you could do the wind um, so the wind direction that's expected and um, for example you could do this for the old uh, wind if your wind is coming from the side 
it could be that um, it suddenly favours one runway or another and they might decide to do a runway change. Um, and I'll tell you how to keep an ear out for runway change in a bit. Um, so if it's a very crosswind, watch out for runway changes. And this is where your purple line we drew earlier is going to um, come into play because you might want to hoof it round to the other side of the runway. And generally speaking, say military airfields, I mean, civil airfields are a constant stream of, of spaced traffic, depending on how busy it is. But military airfields tend to go off in like waves, certainly fighter airfields. So you'll go in the morning, you'll probably find um, you'll have takeoffs um, to start with. And so you might want to be around here somewhere uh, for takeoffs. Um, on that so you might want to explore somewhere here in the morning for takeoffs and then when this the first waves start coming back in you might want to be around here and um, to get better shots of them landing so you might want a waypoint over here and um, well he's about to get shot he's in the secure area um and then for the afternoon you might want to be back around here and uh, for the departures, you want to be back around here for the arrivals, depending totally what shots you want, depending where the wind's coming from, depending where the sun's going to be. That what That's what will make you a great aviation photographer. It's not the size of the lens, it's what you do with it. Speaking of which, don't think because I don't think the guys with the biggest lenses are, are the ones, the guys and girls with the biggest lenses are the ones that know. Uh, what they're doing. I know some great photographers with small lenses and big lenses and I know some rubbish ones with money to burn that buy big lenses and I haven't got a clue which where end of the camera does what. Um, so don't go off the size of the lens. It is not a measure of the knowledge of the person. Uh, right, uh, let me get back to my old notes. Uh, circuits, we've done that. Fastest way from one threshold to another. Threshold is the bit before the runway. Uh, we've done TAFs and METARs. Uh, one thing we mentioned with wind, particularly at bases with the old warbirds, the old tail dragging warbirds, they don't do well in crosswinds. So if you've got a high run wind in, uh, runway crosswind component, um, you might find that they won't fly. Um, BBMF have limits like 10 knots and 15 knots for flying on their crosswind. Um, they also sometimes use this one way to help them a, a little bit get rid of that crosswind component. Um, so bear that in mind. Cloud base, keep an eye on the cloud base. You know you've got your app on your mobile now, so it's easy to keep a, keep an eye on your cloud base. Um, because um, depending on the level of qualification, some pilots aren't qualified to fly in instrument meteorological conditions, only visual meteorological conditions. So if it's a day where the visual circuit is unfit, they will all be coming in on ILS or PAR approaches or SRA approaches on this a big long line here and we're generally coming straight in if a visual ver uh, circuit is unfit, straight into land or as they call it on the radio, full stop. Um, so bear that in mind, if the cloud is low, you'll probably get a little bit less flying because those uh, vis-only pilots aren't cleared to fly in those conditions. Um, so you'll need someone who's uh, current and up to date with their instrument approaches. Um, right, so we're doing quite well here actually. So this map's already got key points on it. Another thing about where to go to watch out for uh, is how you how you know you can access a certain area so like I said with sides of the road be very careful on fast roads parking you certainly don't want to be blocking a lane on a fast road keep attention to things like uh, WL lines any parking restrictions you're going to want to keep an eye on uh, you're going to use um, satellite imagery to see things like this. Laybys are very handy. So get on your old waypoints. Stick a waypoint on that to remind you there's a parking place there. Oops, I've just moved something. Let's undo that. Oh, I've done it again. Let's undo that and zoom out. Right. Ah, it's me. Uh, it's me visual circuit. I keep moving. Um. So yeah, you, so looking for parking things, do not 
blocked, uh, like I say, don't block crash gates, don't block entrances to people's houses. Pretty much the key to being a good, nice, friendly spotter is knowing where you're legally entitled to be and know where you aren't. Um, they will come, uh, the security forces will sometimes come out and have a chat with you. They're generally friendly people, uh, apart from the odd character who's got out a bed the wrong side in the morning uh, but they're generally, certainly busier bases they're used to spotters and used to having a chat um, if you're going to be parking up at a more remote location I would this is what I personally do is I put a little uh, note in my car saying I'm an aircraft and yeah, photographer um, I'm parking here and I intend to walk to whatever point I would name the point or give a grid reference and I would say um, any problems give me a call on my mobile and this is my mobile number and I just leave that in the window of the car so the, you know when the security doing the patrols um, that gives them a bit, little bit more reassurance than thinking it's a security threat really and if they want they can give you a call and have a chat with you if they need you to move your car, it's just a good idea. Um, viewing areas, a lot of these aircraft, uh, places have viewing areas. You can Google them, uh, viewing area, what, uh, whatever place. They're often marked on the map. Aircraft spotters car park, perfect example, popped up there. Um, so yeah, knowing where to be is key. Now, all as such, all areas have what they call uh, definitive maps. So for Coningsby, it's in Lincolnshire. So this is the Lincolnshire County Council Definitive Countryside Access Map Service. And that will show you all the different types, foot pass, bridleways, blah, 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 and where they are. So if I zoom in terribly, um, you can see these are footpaths where you can go along. Um, so if you're on these footpaths, um, really no one can have a moan at you if you're along that footpath with your cameras. So know where you are allowed to be and know where you're not allowed to be. Simple as that. Um, so check your the definitive map, uh, obviously Ordnance Survey maps, which this is based on a 1 to 50,000 scale, will have public footpaths and bridleways and things like that mapped on it. Uh, but it's always a good idea to check the definitive map for an area as I've showed you there. So again, it's the county council for the area you're in, uh, definitive map, blah de blah Right, uh, so and then you can even start drawing on your map um, where your footpaths are. You know, if you've got a footpath that you want to, to walk along, um, you, you can draw them up. And then you can send this to your mobile device for it on your mobile device pc tablet laptop whatever you take with you on the day um so yeah again piss poor planning piss poor performance so do your planning these are all the resources that i i recommend you use i've uh, gone through uh, again start with your official ones work out where your runway is get all your wind sorted um, go visit the local viewing area you know if there's a burger van or something like that and um, go go and have a chat with them obviously because you're you're uh, brilliant publicly reminded people and you do stuff like you go to my website and think you know that was a great video he, he spent a lot of time doing that I'm gonna send him a quid on the donate button because you, because I know you're all people like that then you will go to the spotted areas and you will buy a can of coke you know I'll grab a can of coke from the uh, burger van man Um obviously don't not buy anything and pump him for as much information as he's got because he's probably not going to be very happy he or she and um, so use the local facilities they're often businesses with uh, you know they don't make a lot of profit these these places and they're here for our enjoyment um, and here to give us the amenities that we enjoy so make, make sure you you take your business to to the local spotted areas and buy something um, there and uh, no tams you're going to want to check your no tams 
certainly before and after so if we, if we go on to Coningsby here this is no time info website or you can do it on the Nats website have handy things like opening hours for flying so you're not gonna you're not gonna end up uh, looking an idiot rocking up to an airfield that's closed that day because uh, the Queen's coming to uh, eat cucumber sandwiches with the station commander and she don't want any noise or anything daft like that. Um, if the airfield's closed, you, you're going to know about it in your NOTAMs. Um, so check your NOTAMs. Um, and check all your camera gear. Make sure you put everything on charge because uh, a lot of things do need to be on the night before. And they're not... On the day, I would arrive at a rendezvous point, meet your friends, if you meeted any friends, a Marty rendezvous point on the map, send them the map, this is where we're meeting, this is the time, um, there's always that one, it'll arrive half an hour later, but you know, such is life. Um, so remember to tell your friends where to meet, um, or if you've got a terrible bladder, like some of my friends, you know who you are, uh, meet at the local public toilets. Again, Google is your friend, public toilets, Coningsby, I'm sure you'll find them. Um, so meet at the public toilets or the local McDonald's or something like that. Um, have that on the map. Um, then make sure you've got anything prepped that you need, sort of uh, thing, things like water, sunscreen, uh, wastewater bottle. Um, fortunately, most spotters stereotypically are male and they were born with the equipment um the uh the pito tube i think they call it that you can have a discreet um um offload should we say into a into a water bottle if you're caught short so i do feel for the ladies it's a slightly more complicated process i'm led to believe uh, so it might not be as easy as taking a waste water bottle into the more remote airfields uh, but remember things like that um, why have I got onto this subject? This is a problem with doing it in one take when I can't stop my brain from going into these strange little tangents and deviations. I just have to go with it and see where the journey takes us. Um, so yeah, so then when you when you arrive at your rendezvous point, you turn your scanner into tune your scanner, turn your scanner, tune your scanner into the ATIS, which we have discussed. Uh, where's my ATIS? Matis, Matis, tell you what, let's do it. Control F, Atis. Atis frequency, 270 decimal 8. That is a generally automated or recorded uh, recording done every, uh, refreshed every hour that just repeats the airfield information that you would find on your metal and any other pertinent information like display times, closure times, runway state, weather. It's all going to be repeated on the ATIS, and you can listen to that. And like I say, the update every hour. Generally, the first one will be called Alpha, so information code Alpha, time dot zero seven hundred Zulu, runway two five, color code whatever. Yeah, it goes on like that. You've heard it before. So check the ATIS because that can again, it's for pilots, but it gives us some great information. Uh, it will confirm the runway in use, the circuit direction, things like that. So tune into your ATIS. Um, take your litter home with you. If you're, you know, the particularly kind-hearted spotter that goes on and goes, this is a great video and we'll donate a quid because it's a good video, you'll be the type of person that might want to take a spare bin bag with you and in some downtime between flying, pick up some litter, in the spotting areas generally speaking it's not spotters who drop litter but if they see spotters picking up litter you know farmers landowners uh, security personnel they're more likely to be friendly to spotters and enthusiasts or whatever you want to call us toggers whatever whatever you want to call yourselves um so a, a spare bin bag can be a public spirited thing to take along with you uh in some downtime in flying obviously don't cut holes in fences or do anything daft like that don't park in front of crash gates know exactly where you're legally entitled to be um know the, have the definitive map there and uh, know what's a public area and what's a private area don't park on double yellow lines, all that stuff. Uh, one tip I would say is with your camera gear, take your camera bag to your car and then check your gear is all in the bag. 
a final check before you go. There's no end of times, but that's a mile the half. I, I, I'm a bit of a cripple, so she helps me out. Um, I know, not politically correct at all, but it's me I'm talking about, so I think it's fine. I don't know. I'll have to ask the authorities on this PC matters. But but yes, so because I'm a bit of a cripple, um, my other half loads my camera bag for me into the car. Very kind of her. It's very heavy. Um, but there's been now and again that I've taken the camera out to do something at the desk. And I've rocked up at the airfield, opened the bag and found a great big empty space where my camera should be. So don't, don't, don't be like me, is what I would say, you know. Um... A clever man learns from his mistakes, or a wise man learns from the mistakes of others, or something like that. So, so um, take your camera bag to your car, check your gear, check your, you've got a card, check there's a card in the camera, check your batteries, check your, all your lenses, you've got your main body, your spare body, anything else you, you know, you want to take along with you for the ride. And then put it in your car and lock your car while you get in your other things. Good friend of mine. Um, the locals got used to him putting his camera gear in his car and going spotting and when he turned around went inside just to grab something they half inched it and drove off down the road at a great rate of knots with all his lovely camera gear so don't do that lesson to be learnt so I think I've waffled on enough I don't know how long this video is um, oh, I told you it would be nearly an hour but uh, yeah Get yourself on Google My Maps, draw some pretty pictures, and feel free to send me your pretty pictures, because you'll make a better job of it than I did. And if you've got any questions, um, feel free to write them uh, below, and I'll get back to you. And get in touch with my Twitter, Facebook, website, whatever. And if you think I could do a better job, tell me to re do a uh, re-record of the video. Or if you don't like it, you've already twitched off by now. So, bye. Uh, yeah, so I hope you found it useful. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the support, as always. I hope you're all well. And when I've thought about the next subject for the next video, I will see you again on my YouTube channel. But until then, take care. I'll see you next time.